This is the um, class on 1 Samuel, and we are back in 1 Samuel 17 to the story of David and Goliath. So, in the way of announcements, not much. We'll be meeting on Tuesdays for a while yet. I don't know if a Tuesday we won't meet, but there'll be surely some coming up as we get into the summertime. Um, I'm going to turn it up just one more notch. I'm having trouble hearing myself. So, but I do want to tell you about something coming up. So, for about, maybe not a year, but for a long time, Arthur's been talking about this cruise that, that's coming up. So, the cruise is actually basically done, all the details and everything of it. We've put the whole thing together. And the live link to register is going to go out on Monday. And it's a cruise on Celebrity that's going to leave Athens the Friday after Easter next year. Now, we were hoping to do the fall next year, but we couldn't. It was just, it's, there's just so many people going that we couldn't get a group like ours because we're holding 160 births, births for 160 people on the ship. And um, it will sail out of Athens on April, Friday, April 5th, and it will go to um, Ephesus. Uh, not, this is not in order. Ephesus, three days in Israel with the usual guides we have and the, that whole thing. And then to Egypt, so we can go down and see the pyramids and the Sphinx. And we'll come back to Athens. And before we leave Athens, you would have the opportunity to tour Athens and go up to the Acropolis and the Parthenon. Um, remember, um, Acts, Acts 17 is Paul in Athens. And if you want to, we are also going to put together a day trip to Corinth. And if you come in a little bit early, you could run, go up to Corinth for the day. And of course, Corinth is where Paul has spent time and then is writing letters to 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. So um, it's really, I think it'll be a great, a great cruise. And um, the travel agency has done a good job of putting together a, a, a package for us with, and celebrities been generous with some of the things, amenities that they're offering us. And it'll all be available. I'll probably send out that info, as some of it as part of my Friday update, but without the registration link. And then the registration link will go out to the church on Monday, and I will send an email out to my email list, which is the rosters of my three classes, on Monday as well with the link. So just want to make sure. You might end up with two emails, but better than none. So I've been asked about the cost, um, including the, the way it's packaged is the, the cruise with three days in Israel, um, um, including gratuities and a drink package and Wi-Fi and stuff, and that's around $4,000 a person, to which you would add airfare um, and probably excursions in Ephesus. And so if people ask me, I would, I would budget $7,7500 probably, $7,500 would probably do it but you will have some choices to make along the way that could raise the price or lower the price, okay? So um, you would put down now a $400, $450 refundable deposit per person and that would be refundable up until December 20th of this year and if those who booked, Celebrity said those who booked by June 1st will get a $200 shipboard credit per cabin. Not per person, per cabin, which is just $200 of money to spend on the ship for this and that. So that's everything I know, all given to you right now. And the link's gonna go out on Monday. So I just wanted you to have some readiness for it if you were thinking about joining us. And if you are thinking about joining us, I, I urge you to, to do it. It's going to be a, a great trip and, and we're going to have a big St. Andrew group and it's, it's, got, it's just got a great itinerary. Ephesus, Israel, Egypt, Athens. It's, it's sort of, that's, that's sort of a home run right there. Okay, so any questions about that? 
And if it falls too quickly, yeah, the ARTA, ARTA is the travel agency, and I'm getting them to do as much of this as possible. So ARTA will run, will run a, a wait list um, if it fills up, whenever it fills up. Let me put it that way. Yes. It is 10 days on the ship, um, like 11 days, 10 nights, however that's calculated. We, we, we leave Athens on the 5th, return to Athens on the 15th of April next year. Everything's from the ship. So every night you'll come back. This is what I like about it. Every night you come back, you get to sleep in your own, you un unpack one time, get to come back, sleep in your own bed. Um, I, I like that, I like that, that part of it. Only the Israel days are included in the package price that you will see next Monday when you can see it live. The other ones will be ship tours, but I'm guessing most of us will do them together, okay, okay which is what's, what has happened before. But we want to do the Israel Days so that we could get this, we're doing it with the manual tours again. We're getting Lior and Neil and Maddie, if you were on the last trip, and we're going to probably have four buses, but we like the manual tours people, and we love the guides that we get through them, so... Neil is well. Neil's well enough to do this. He's, got, he's, he's well enough to do this now. It's, it's a miracle. So he had a bad motorcycle accident. For the, so he's an, Israel, an Israeli guide we've used several times. But he had a really, really terrible motorcycle accident. So anything else? Uh, Pat. You, Wait, over, he, over here. Does he want to mention what pastors are going? Yes, yeah, so who's going? We're, we're going to, as always on these trips, we have leaders on the buses so it's going to be um patty and i will be going lauren gerlock and creighton will be going uh arthur jones and becky will be going and then a seventh pastor will be going but i'm not comfortable with saying a name right now that that's one of the little things that still i need to get confirmation of but we will it's the way we do it we i i think the trip is better because we have leaders from the church who are on the buses and on the ship and and it's it's just the right way to do it so anyway we'll have as i think as good a trip as we've ever had and the first six trips patty and i have led to israel um have been super and they've been both the 10-day land trips and the cruises yes When we go to Ephesus, I hope they will have. It will, we will have to use the ship's excursions. I don't think we're planning on doing some customized excursion, but we'll see. I guess I want to say that because it's been, it's been a bit of a quick, quick move, okay, to get this far because when we found out we had to go in April as opposed to October of next year, that kind of put everything on a on a fast speed. So some of the things are still to be finally, finally determined. But yeah. What yes. So is the uh, new subject, so the addition of Scott Anderson, yes. was that enabled by the fact that we disaffiliated with United Methodist Church and he didn't need to come through that hierarchy? Not really. So I'm being asked if Scott Anderson coming on board was uh, enabled by the disaffiliation? Not really. I guess in a, in, in a way, but really, um, he he was already retired, so we can hire retired clergy. But maybe it was helped by that. So I I'll, I'll just I'll just say I'm not sure. But we have been running. We are a big church. We are a very active church, and we've only had five ordained pastors for a while now, and that is not enough. We have a big congregation, a lot of people marrying, bear, dying, <laughs> birthing, everything, everything. Yeah. So, so it's really good that, that Scott's coming on. Um, he's a really, he seems to be a great guy. Patty and I are having lunch with Scott and his wife on Thursday just to get to know them a little bit better. And um, I'm preaching on Sunday morning and he is one of the liturgists on Sunday. So, you know. The older guys are back in strength again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Andy.
talking to him after church, and then he said the same stuff in Sunday school. Yes. But I don't know the difference between justification and sanctification. Okay, well, if you think of our salvation consisting of both a gift from God and a task that we undertake to be more and more like Jesus, justification is this gift that God gives us. Sanctification is the task that we undertake with the Holy Spirit to become more and more like Jesus. That's, and and both, are, both are important. And in the Nazarene tradition is emphasizing that there is this need to become more and more like Christ. So we talked about it on, in, in my Sunday class a few weeks ago. So, so that's it. There we go. Anything else? Very good. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are grateful to be here today. We come to the story of David and Goliath and just help us to enjoy this story. There'll be theology in it, but it's, it's a story where the writers and the storytellers took great care and help us to appreciate that and uh, come to see your hand at work um, in this very, very well-known story. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and put the map up. This is the battlefield. We talked about it this last week. This is the Valley of Elah is between the two armies, the Israelite army on one ridge line and the Philistine army on the other ridge line, and it's the name of it is the Valley of Elah, or Elah, if there's even a difference there. And when we, when we came to, to 1 Samuel 17, we just sort of did the introduction of Goliath last week. Okay? Well, what did it consist of? He's a huge man. He's nine feet tall. His armor, his spear, his javelin, everything's immense. Everything weighs a ton. He's just, and this is, understand, this is in a world in which people are not our size, right? Really, really. We are our size because we have the benefit of clean water and other things. Penicillin and other antibiotics and the rest of it that enable people to grow up taller and stronger. This was struck home to me when I went to, been to certain places where I look at the length of really old beds from 300 years ago, and they're so short, right? But they fit those people. So Goliath is enormous. He's, he's enormous, and of course that factors mightily into the story that we're going to pick up now. And when we go through this, what I really do want you to do is to enjoy the story. Clearly you can tell by the length of it, the detail in it, that this is the story that was meant to be told. Storytellers around campfires, storytellers in front of crowds, um, and enjoying the story, retelling it time and again. It's an art form. It's an art form that is still practiced in the Mideast today. There's oral storytelling that preserves the stories. Because the storyteller can, can kind of like make it come alive a bit, but there are limitations. Okay, the, the storyteller has to get things right. And um, so, all right. So, let's see. So I want to start at verse 8. I don't need, we don't really need to go back to the introduction of Goliath himself. He's a really big, frightening man. So, Goliath stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel. Gathered right there on the other side of the... Uh, of, of the Wadi, the creek bed. Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man, and have him come down to me. So he wants a champion from the Israelite army to come down and face him, and they'll go mano a mano, right? Man to man. If he is able to fight and kill me, we, the Philistines, will become your subjects. 
But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Now we know what the deal works. So Philistine goes, the Goliath goes out. He wants an Israelite champion. They will fight and, you know, win or take all. Is that kind of it? Yeah. Well, then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Why were they dismayed and terrified? The guy's nine feet tall. Who, wa who wants to go fight him? Nobody wants to go fight him. You ever seen the old movies where you'll have a line of, of, of soldiers lined up and the sergeant says, okay, I need a volunteer. And all but one are in the plan <laughs> where the guys take one step back and leave one person out or yeah. Or being, how about being voluntold? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna, no, they're dismayed and terrified. Whoa, this, whoa, how can we do this? Look at that guy. We got nobody on our side who's nine feet tall. Verse 12. Now David was the son of an Ephrath <laughs> Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem and Judah. Jesse had eight sons. And in Saul's time, he was very old. Now, you might say to me, well, we know some of this already. You only know it already because it's in your book of Samuel. If it's just a story about David and Goliath, then this stuff needs to be told up front. That's, that, that's why it's there. It's not like the writer doesn't understand that you know all about David and the brothers, but the story these stories are told and then collected and compiled and edited and they turn into the book of 1 Samuel. Okay? Now, Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. They took up arms. They're soldiers, right? The firstborn was Eliab, the second was Abinadab, and the third Shema. David was the youngest of whom the eight sons. Now the three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep in Bethlehem. Now we're not told what he's doing for Saul, but if you go back to the previous story, you know that what he's doing is, remember he's playing the liar. Saul would get all kind of dark and despondent um, because God's spirit, God's hand had been removed from Saul. And Saul is thinking it's... it's sinking further and further into this spiritual darkness. The spiritual darkness. And sometimes it overcomes him, as it would anybody, I think. And so David would come and he'd play the lyre and music. But David had work to do back home as well. So he would go from, um, uh, from Saul to Bethlehem and take care of the sheep and then go back, uh, presumably once in a while, and play music for Saul. All right, we cool? Everybody cool? Verse 16, for 40 days the Philistines came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. So for 40 days, Goliath walks out and he makes this same statement. In, in your Bible, do you notice how many 40s there are? There are lots of 40s, okay? And they can have, the 40 can have a theological significance, like the 40 years in the wilderness, um, in the book of Exodus, and Jesus' 40 days of testing. Um, it, is, it, it marks a period of time, usually of testing, that is neither really short nor super long. That's that's what it is. So so that it was a it was a he common Hebrew way to convey a period of time that was neither really short nor really long. It doesn't really mean in our Western ways that we would have calendars and stopwatches out there, right? Checking each thing off. But he is coming out day after day after day after day after day and issuing the same challenge. 
Now Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah, that's a measure of weight, about 36 pounds, of roasted grain, and take these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. So, you know, the brothers need to eat. The, uh, they did, feeding armies was very difficult in these days, right? There's no big commercial food production. There's no railroads to move anything. There's no trucks. There's no nothing. So feeding an army was a challenge. So it's not surprising that Jesse's going to look out for his sons. And he's going to send little, little, little David, right, with his food. And then he says, in verse 18, take along these 10 cheeses. I know you're Patty says, I know I'm tempted, but I'm going to stay away, Patty. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. Now, what would that assurance be for Jesse? <coughs> that he's okay, that the sons are okay, right? He's a dad. He just wants to make sure his sons are okay. He say he has, granted he has eight of them, but he loves them all. And the three eldest are all off, off there fighting with Saul. And do you think, <coughs> do you think word is spread about Goliath? Oh, you could bet on it. It's been 40 days. It's been a long time. And every day that man comes out and issues the same challenge. And every day the Israelites shrink away in terror and fear. So of course people hear about it. Verse 19. They, he's saying to David, are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. So early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up, and set out as Jesse had directed he reached the camp as the army was going out to take its battle positions. I don't know, day 41, let's say. <laughs> Shouting the war cry, because they're so brave, right? Oh, yeah, so they go line up for like the 41st time now. Yes, boom, 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 we're ready, we're ready, we're ready. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other, and David left, left his things, the stuff he brought, with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and asked his brothers how they were. He wants to know. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw this man, this Goliath, this giant, they all fled from him in great fear. Nobody's willing to do it. I mean, how long can this go on? Well, look at verse 25. The Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out, this Goliath guy, every day, the same thing? Day after day after day, he comes out to defy Israel. Well, the king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt, I love this one, will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. <laughs> going to lead a tax-free life, baby. You're going to get gold and you're going to get the daughter of the king, if you will go and fight Goliath, all that's yours if you win. <laughs> if you win. Because if, if the Israelite soldier goes out and fights and doesn't win, what does that mean for him? You got it. Goliath will have finished them off. That's what he's basically saying. It's a fight to the death. So, verse 26 little David, who's the shepherd, right? He's standing the, and the music player. David asked the men standing with him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That he should defy the armies of the living God. 
now you can put a theological marker, right? That's the first thought of God in this story. Who is this giant who's coming out to this Gentile, that's what uncircumcised means, this Gentile coming out to find the armies of the living God? Well, they repeated to him what they had been saying and they told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. They, if he lives and kills Goliath, which is what it would take, he's going to get gold and uh, a wife who's the daughter of the king and a tax-free existence. <laughs> no more IRS for that guy. Okay? <laughs> I love this. Well, <laughs> yeah, 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 we just kind of like we're there, huh? Okay, small drink of water. Is everything working online, dear? It is. Good. It is. I guess you just keep going. Chris Amundsen. What? Chris Amundsen. Hi, Chris Amundsen. Chris from North Carolina, my buddy. Yes. Yes. Norwegian Chris, we call him, yes. His daughter is, the, she's, she's like, oh, she must be eight or nine by now. Um, she just looks like a, a, a Norse princess with her blonde hair. She does. She's, a, she's adorable. So anyway, hi, Chris. So <laughs> it's pretty cool that I can be here and he can be there and we're doing this, right? And just enjoying this story of David and Goliath. Verse 28, when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at David. And he asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? You got a job to do, kid. I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now that seems a little harsh to me. Right? I mean, Dad sent him with food, and, and Eliab's first reaction is, you're conceited and arrogant, so you, leave, you left the sheep and came down here? I don't know what the backstory is to all of this, with the family and the brothers. Maybe there is a backstory to it all. I don't know, but like, wow, really? Okay. I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David. Can't I even speak? This is, this, these are brothers. This is how brothers talk, right? Can't I even speak, David says. He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. Great wealth, daughter of the king, tax-free life. Yeah. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul and Saul sent for him. Saul knows him, right? Because we know that David has been playing the liar for Saul. We're told in verse 15 that David would go back and forth between Saul and the sheep. Saul and the sheep. So David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of the Philistines. Your servant will go and fight for him. That's what David says. So Saul sends for David. David goes to Saul and says, Okay, your servant, I will do this. I'm the tender of sheep. I'm the player of liars. And I will go and fight this nine-foot giant for you. What do you think Saul's reaction is? Don't read any further. What do you think his reaction is? Sure. Oh, David, really? Really? Come on, man. You're a kid. You're young. I know you're brave, and you've, you've really done a great job of taking care of those sheep, and you're a master of, on that music, but dude, he probably didn't say dude. I understand. That's a modern thing. But dude, the guy's nine feet tall. There's no fighter in Israel that's willing to fight him. So let's see what Saul actually says. Verse 33, Saul replied, 
you're not able to go out and fight against the Philistine. And you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man. He has been a warrior from his youth. Dot, dot, dot. And he's nine feet tall. <laughs> right? <laughs> but David said to Saul, your servant, he's speaking of himself here, right? So David is, your, David is Saul's servant. Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. I'm a pretty tough guy. Don't doubt that. I'm a tough guy. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine. No emphasis on un uncircumcised. Why? Because he's a Gentile. He is not part of the people of God. So let me just pause for a moment to make sure that your vocabulary in Bible stuff is in good shape. Okay. From the Jewish perspective, there are Jews and there are Gentiles. The Jews are the people of God. Okay? Gentiles are everybody else. Regardless of what we would call today nationality or race or whatever you might think of, Jews and Gentiles, the whole world can be divided into those two categories. And the Jews are the ones to whom God came and have ma has made great promises, has given the law. The Jews are the ones that God is, through whom God is going to rescue humanity. The Jews are the ones who worship the one and only God. There is only one God. The pagan gods don't exist, right? They're figments of people's spiritual imaginations. There is only one God, and that God is the God who came to Abraham. That God is the one who came to Moses. That God is the one for whom these Israelites fight because the Israelites constitute the people of God and the Gentiles are not part of that. Is that clear? Okay. I gotta refine my place. Okay, oh yes, okay. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. <laughs> Why? Because of David's skill, David's mightiness, David's strength with the sword, anything? Because he has defied the armies of the living God. That's why. That's why. Simply put, that's why. Then he says, the Lord, Yahweh, who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. David has complete trust in God, complete faith in God. You might call him foolish because Goliath is nine feet tall. <laughs> but David utterly trusts God that this is, this is not how it should be, that this Gentile Philistine should be defying day after day after day the Israelites and day after day the cowardice of the Israelites being shown, right? Because it's really two things are going on. Phil Goliath is offering the challenge and the Israelites are too scared to respond. Not one champion from the Israelite army, no matter how good, how talented, how big, how strong, has been willing to come out because he's made the calculation, I go out and I'm dead. That's not David's calculations. David's calculation is, I will go out and God will see that I live, that I am victorious. Because they, the Philistines, the one here on this side, they are defying the armies of the living God. Scott, yes, Patty. Uh huh. Jew who's ready to kill them all is, right? He's still made in the image of God. 
he is made in the image of God, but we, everybody on the planet, so let's go back to our categories. Everybody on the planet is made in the image of God. Then there are some on the planet who are the people of God, the family of God. What, what constitutes this family of God? Being made in God's image? No. Worshiping God, acknowledging God, putting your faith in God. Remember the story of Ruth. Ruth is a Moabite, not an Israelite. And when Naomi is going to return, what does Ruth say to her? I'm going to go with you. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And so Ruth steps in to the people of God. And she becomes the great-grandmother of David in the, in the lineage. So um, that's why it's important to understand who we're talking about. Everybody's made in the image of God. But a subset of that are the people of God. And the people of God at this time are the Israelites because they are the family of Abraham, the one God made the great promises to in Genesis 12, 3, that God would give Abraham a great land, many descendants, and that all of the families of the earth, everyone made in the image of God, would be blessed through Abraham. So Abraham's family becomes the family, the ones through whom God will rescue everyone, that is, all those who are made in the image of God. Does that make, does sense. make sense? So um, it's kind of like the New Testament. Um, in the New Testament, who are the children of God? The children of God is not all of humanity. The children of God is the family of God. The children of God are those who are brothers and sisters in the worship of the one living God. All humanity is made in the image of God, and we always need to remember that. But we don't read the Bible well if we think that we come to the New Testament, and one of the writers is referring to the children of God, and that's everybody on the planet. That's not, you'll misread the paragraph that you're in at the time. Yes? Well, so, so Jim is pointing out that it appears that David's the only one who seems to have faith. He's the only one who's getting this right. He's the only one who's focusing on the same thing. My, does this help us understand why God chose David? Yeah, you see? You see this? God, we, we know that God has already chosen David, that Samuel came and anointed David. Now we're beginning to see why. It was David. Perhaps that's why. But you're right. Nobody else there, nobody else there has the faith to stand up and say, well, yeah, I'm going to walk over and take on this nine-foot giant because God's going to see that I win. So back to verse 37. Big verse, like the couple of others we've had already. Yahweh, who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. So, any other thoughts or questions I can help you with? I have, I have yeah. You know, after facing a lion and a bear, yes. probably just a slingshot, I don't think nine foot was scary. Well... <laughs> I don't know. What, what the, the point being made is after facing a lion and a bear with a slingshot, though that's not what it says. It doesn't say how he killed the lion and the bear. But that he, here's what, we, here's what, okay, let me back up. There is a whole book written on the story of David and Goliath by a man named Malcolm Gladwell, who takes the whole story and looks at all the medical things that are wrong with Goliath and why he would actually be so beatable, basically. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story is Jim's, that David is the one who says, he is defying the armies of the living God, and God will carry me through this. That's, that's the theology in the story. Every, everything you, well, okay, two things. Every story you read in the Old Testament does not have a moral point. They're not Aesop's fables, okay? 
but there's a driving theology through the Old Testament. And so you have this, this, this even the theological bits in the midst of the story of David and Goliath. And it's the folk, I'm not, not, not to, Malcolm Gladwell doesn't come to this from a position of faith, right? We should. That's why we have this story, actually, right? Otherwise, it would have been lost long, long ago. So, so, but being young, I will say, young people are kind of, they can be kind of foolhardy, right? You know, in the virtues, every virtue has its corresponding vice. There's the virtue courage, but the corresponding vice is foolhardiness. So David might have a little bit of foolhardiness too, right? Because he's, he's young. So Saul said to David, go, and Yahweh be with you. Okay, I'll take it a faith by you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. This is this outer garment, a shirt-like thing. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fasted on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. He's not used to wearing this armor and stuff that the king has given him. He says to Saul, I can't go in these. I'm not used to them. Can you imagine what he'd look like? Stumbling around, you know, and he's trying to make his way with this big armor and everything, you know, and he's like, ah, come on. I, can't, I cannot go in these. I'm not used to them. So we took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand. That's just the stick, right? Chose five smooth stones from the stream. You know, yeah, five smooth stones. And put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag. And with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. So David's actually going to do this. Can you imagine what the men lined up in the Israeli battle line must have thought and what the men lined up in the Philistine battle line must have thought and what Goliath might have thought as he stood there in his nine-foot immense, immensity, 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 and David comes walking across, you know, not wearing much, it's a warm part of the world. He's got a little pouch on, he's got something in his hand, he's got, no, he's got a stick. Pat, are you wound up or what? <laughs> I love this story. I'm just, I'm just thinking Goliath must have been, what? Okay, so <laughs> meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. Now, you see, Gladwell says that what that's about is the condition that has made Philistine, made Goliath into this lumbering, this slow lumbering giant also affects his vision. That, that's part of what the book is about. And so Goliath is, is, is getting closer and closer to take a look. I could also say... In his astonishment at this relatively little person coming out, he's going over to take, is this it? Is it, right? He looked David over. <laughs> and saw that he was a little more than a boy. Glowing with health and handsome. Yes, but who cares, right? Goliath despised him. Why did he despise him? He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? So what does Goliath mean? You're dissing me in current language. You're disrespecting me. This is the champion you send out to fight me? This little shepherd boy, I can hardly... He's so, so tiny, I can hardly see him. He's lost in the sagebrush or whatever it is that's out there, right? This is who you send? <coughs> Am I a dog that you would send him out to fight 
Me? And the, and the Philistine cursed David by whom? His gods. Remember the Philistines, of course, are pagans. Everybody's, everybody is, has gods. The Israelites have only one. They, they're not at a point in their history where they believe that there is only one God. They just believe that they have the best God on the block. And the pagan pantheon, these like the Philistine pantheons, remember Dagon when the Ark of the Covenant went into the Philistine tent and the statue fell over and all that stuff. So they've got a whole pantheon of pagan gods and goddesses just like everybody did. Everybody would in Jesus' day, the Greek gods, the Roman gods the Scythian gods, all the, the Numidian gods, all the rest of them. Say that three times fast. <laughs> and so Goliath cursed David by his gods. And notice how the storyteller doesn't even want to say the name Goliath. I'm using it in my reading of this, but he's always just the Philistine. Sometimes the uncircumcised, the Philistine. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of Yahweh Almighty, Yahweh Shaddai Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day Yahweh will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down, and I will cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or by spear that Yahweh saves, for the battle is Yahweh's, and he will give all of you into our hands. God doesn't operate as other people operate. This whole world is God's. And notice when, it, when David says the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel, that is, we could connect a dot back to the time of the Exodus. There's a lot in the story of the Exodus about God defeating Pharaoh so that the whole world will know who God is. Because the world doesn't know. I mean, God came to Abraham. That's it. Yahweh did not show up at the, with the Egyptians or the um, Sumerians or the Akkadians or all the other ancient peoples that existed. He came to this one man, Abraham, the man whose family became known as the Hebrews or the Israelites and later the Jews. But so that the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. You know, what task does Jesus give us? To be his witnesses in Judea Samaria, to the ends of the earth, right? Why? So that people will know who God is. That task of, of the world coming to understand who God is, um, is is part and parcel of this from the beginning. And it reaches its culmination in Jesus and the commission that, that Jesus gives all of us. So, all of those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that Yahweh saves. For the battle is Yahweh's and he will give all of you into our hands. Goliath would just be shaking his head. You've got to be kidding me. All right, okay. All right, we'll do this. Well... As the Philistine, Goliath, moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. He doesn't walk, he runs. He doesn't run slowly, he runs quickly to meet Goliath. He's ready for this. 
Reaching into his bag, taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. But didn't he have a helmet? Yeah, but helmet doesn't cover everything. Okay. There's always vulnerable spots, okay. whether it's ancient war helmets or modern football helmets. <laughs> right? So he gets it, that stone, he gets that stone up there and it hits him right here, right in the right place. He gets what is some, what? Like this massive concussion, right? And of course, in Gladwell's book, what he works out is the speed of these stones. And that was fascinating part of the book. That, that with these slings, if you read ancient, uh, about ancient warfare, ancient armies had whole, had whole like a whole corps of slingers, people and archers and spearmen, but they had a lot of these slingers, these people who were skilled at using centrifugal force to swing stones around, let them go at the perfect time. And Gladwell says those things arrive at something like this forehead at about the speed of a bullet. He said that they're incredibly fast because of centrifugal force that is available because of the length of the slinger's arm and then the length of the sling itself. Just builds this huge circle and the force just builds up higher and higher. The same thing is what happens with golfers, actually. Girls softball. Golfers, girls soft, go golfers swing the club, but it is a centrifugal force. The smoothest golf swing you ever see is a golfer who has the skill to use centrifugal force to deliver that, the blade of the golf club to the ball. The girls' so softball, they're so fast, but they use this force to deliver this ball and they somehow get it over the plate in the strike zone. I don't understand how. It looks like magic to me. But David has those slinger skills that he honed where? Did he hone them in the army? No, he honed them out with killing off bears and lions and stuff. <laughs> the stone sank into Goliath's forehead and he fell, boom, face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. And David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from beneath the sheath. This is Goliath's sword, which is, of course, huge. And if you want to picture this young kid drawing out this enormous sword, right? But he's strong. Um, and after he killed him, he cut off his head with Goliath's own sword. And there, I should have brought a couple of the paintings. I don't know. I'm not in the habit of putting paintings with this class, but there, there's some great paintings of David holding up the head. I think Caravaggio did one. David holding up the head, and the head's enormous, right? It's this, this victory, and like, wow. So what do you think the effect is on the Philistine army? Um, Superman or Super God? Superman or Super God? So you gotta gotta adjust your thinking just a little bit, you know. So so who has won this battle? I mean, David already pronounced what's going on. He said, "This day Yahweh will deliver you into my hands, and I'm going to strike you down and cut off your head." This is Yahweh's battle. There are many battles like that in the Old Testament. They're Yahweh's battle. There's no other accounting for them other than Yahweh's battle. There's a great story in the book of Judges around a man named Gideon. So he's going to go out and do battle. And God wants Gideon to understand who's going to win this battle. So he keeps telling Gideon to take fewer and fewer and fewer men with him. Because by making the army smaller and smaller and smaller, fighting the same massive force on the other side, it makes it very clear that the victory is God's. Not one in the way people win battles generally in life and in warfare. 
Wow. So, second part of verse 51. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Of course they did. They haven't seen something like this. Because he is a little, David, I mean, compared to Goliath, he is a little guy. This makes no sense to them. The, and it's done by David in the name of the Israelite God. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout, and they pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath. That's uh, one of the five Philistine cities. That's the hometown of Goliath. And to the gates of Ekron, that's a second Philistine city. Their dead, the Philistine dead, were strewn along the Sheraim road to Gath and Ekron. When the, Philistine, when the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. So they chase them all down. They kill as many as they can because this is, the Philistines are the big enemy at this time. They're the bad guys. So they don't want the Philistines to be able to, you know, gather themselves together and try it again. And then they come back to the camp, and of course they plunder the Philistine camp that's empty of the Philistine soldiers. And they take all the stuff that has value. Of course they do. That's warfare. It's what happens. Really, in any war, any time. Verse 54. David took the Philistine's head and he brought it to Jerusalem. He put the Philistine's weapons in his own tent. And as Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is that young man? You might say to yourself, well, doesn't Saul know that? He was just with him? You know, um, I will just say that Saul is, well, I think he's losing it. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, you'll see. You'll see. So Abner rightly, I mean, understandably replies, well, as surely as you live, your majesty, I don't know who he is. The king said, well, find out whose son this young man is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with David, still holding the Philistine's head. Hey, this is a big prize. This is triumph. Whose triumph is this? David's? God's. Whose whose reputation would be magnified countless times over because of this? David, because reputation is something that people give you, right? So how, it's going to be David, whose reputation is going to be expanded and blown outward because of this great victory. But David, at every single point, is there any point in the story, now I'm, this is a sincere question, is there any point in the story where David takes the focus off of God? There is not, I don't think there is. It's a long story, I mean, it's so well told, and it's so long, because it's just such a good story. You can see why, why the storytellers and the writers and the compilers and the editors preserved all of this for us, and it's just, it's just, it's just wonderful, and throughout it, David never takes the spotlight off of God. This is God's victory. It is God who has preserved David's life, and we know that David is God's anointed, right? The only ones who know about David's anointing are his brothers, um, Samuel, and David. Nobody else does, which does raise more questions about one of the brothers calling David conceited and arrogant. Maybe, okay, I never, I never quite thought of this. Could it be that David let the anointing go to his head afterwards? What do you think? I mean, we're not told that, but I don't know. Anyway, I have brothers. I have brothers. 
So yeah, maybe he was. Maybe the brothers just jealous. They knew every time Samuel said, no, nope, not this one. <laughs> no, nope, not this one. <laughs> no, nope, not this one. And the losers have to go out. They're kind of like, what are they like? The They're like the bachelor. <laughs> no, not this one. No, not this one. The bachelor, I love that. Yes, the bachelor. I'll have to remember that, Karen. <laughs> the bachelor. So, verse 58, Saul asked David, well, whose son are you, young man? And David said, I am the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. And just remember that this story is written to basically stand alone. You don't really have to know anything before or anything after, right? It's, it, it's not like a chapter buried in the middle of a modern novel or something like that. It's a, it's a story that would have been told and retold and told and retold and enjoyed and written down and the rest of it. So, and we, and God has seen that we get it, right? So, it's God who has seen that we should get this story as it is. It doesn't mean God wrote it. But I, I was, well, you know, my way of thinking about it is that when it comes to this, it isn't as, it isn't as if God dictated all of this. That's not how it is. But that God's, God's happy enough with it to give it to us because in it we can come to know who God is and in this story, it is all about trusting in God. Look what David did. He trusted in God and he defeated Goliath. That is how mighty God is and that, how is, that is how important trust and faith is. Yes, dear. <clears throat> Online, Linda Waldo made a comment. She said, this reminds her of how Joseph's brothers treated him with the jealousy that they had. See, there's a connection you can make. So if you think of the Joseph and the magic technicolor dream coat, right? Um, how did his brothers treat Joseph, who was the youngest? There is a layer to the Joseph story because he is the child of Rachel, right? The one whom... Jacob loved, whereas he didn't love the mothers of the others, the jealous brothers. But yes, um, there is a connection there. So thank you, Linda. That's super. So let's let's see. Anything else you would like to add today? Scott, I'm, I'm just amazed at the detail in this story. It is really a good story. It's very, for me, it's very... It's very novelistic. It's a lot of attention to descriptions and time and pacing in it. And, and why is that? Because it comes out of a tradition of storytelling. And what do storytellers do? Do storytellers read contracts? Arithmetic tables? Most history books that I've read, there are some historians who are good storytellers, but not most. Storytellers want to tell a story that is, they want to tell it in a way that is engaging. So if you told a storyteller, well, tell me the story of what? I don't know why this came to mind. Lincoln's Assassination by John Wilkes Booth. The storytellers got to want to tell it in a way that's engaging with detail and pace. And all of that, that's what's going on here. And you, I, oh, when I come to a story like this, I can always picture, you know, kids and families gathered around a campfire and somebody says, you know, Uncle Jacob, you know, tell us the story of David and Goliath. And so Uncle Jacob gets up and maybe for the hundredth time he tells the story and he emphasizes some bit and adds a little detail here and there just to make it even better, you know, yeah. That has to be how it happened. Has to be. It's the world they live in. What's the significance of cutting the head off? What's the significance of cutting the head off? You are dead, dead, and dead, buddy. And so it's a trophy. What do hunters in Texas do when they shoot their deer? An elk. What do they what do they mount on the wall? The heads. You know, I know some people get creeped out by that, don't they? Yeah, they, you know, because some people, they have a lot of trophies they have. They have, or even, even animals from Africa, they'll have a head on it. So it's a, same, it's a trophy. It's a trophy. It is sure fire proof. 
that Goliath is dead and David did it. He's like with John the Baptist. Oh, see, John the Baptist. Good connection. So when John, when Herod puts John the Baptist to death, what does he do? He cuts off his head. The girl that asked for it, it is a clear-cut demonstration that he is dead, dead, and dead, and that Herod didn't let him escape out the back door, but he actually did what the girl wanted, and she wanted him dead, and the best proof of that dead death was his head on a platter, which has also generated a number of kind of creepy paintings over the years. Anything else? Yes. Yes, Evie. It is, and of course, if you ask David, what would he say? And David would say, it was God doing all of this. God made sure that stone hit just at the right place. If you ask Malcolm Gladwell, he would go into an eight-page discussion <laughs> of how skilled these slingers were and how, yes, they, they could do that. We've, we don't have that skill anymore because now we have guns and things. But yeah, he's... Gladwell says it is really pretty amazing what the slingers could do, and it's not surprising that in these ancient armies they had whole, you know, like platoons of slingers that they would send out to the battlefield. It was sort, yeah, uh, yeah. I had one of these when I was a kid. Yeah. And, uh, Wait, actually, this kind of not a slingshot, which is cheating. Okay, so John is saying he had a sling. If you can't hear this, John is saying he had a sling. When he was a kid, he practiced a lot, got really good, and could hit a can from 20 yards with a lot, and it would probably kind of, it would probably do a job on that can. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, where did you put a stone when, where you shouldn't have one time? What's the worst place you ever put one of these stones? Through a window? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. So again, it's it's something most of us aren't familiar with because that kind of warfare is so long in the past that we don't have any familiarity with it. But yep. So, the slinger, David. Anything else y'all would like to talk about? We're going to stop right here. We'll, we'll go on to the next. Yes. So Goliath, what, what Susan is pointing out is her commentary points out that in, in the, later in the book of Samuel, you meet another Goliath who's a, who, who's a Philistine, right? What's the three? Okay, well... I guess all I could say to that, Susan, is in the ancient world, there weren't many names that anybody used. That's why Jesus was a common name. That's why there's so many Marys in your New Testament. People, they didn't need a bunch of names because nobody ever really went anywhere. So if you were Susan from Plano, that's really all you needed to know who you are, Susan from Plano. So, so I would say that is more likely to be it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that could be. That could be. But for me, I think this Philistine 
I, I just, I just, I just take the, the face value. This Philistine, this is a Philistine fighter named Goliath, and he's from Gath. He and he's from Gath. Yep. Anything else? Okay. Well, when we come back next week, we will. We're going to move into the section where Saul begins to grow more and more fearful of David, right? Remember what we just said about David's reputation after this great victory. David lays it all at God's feet, but you can imagine the reputation that begins and the stories that begin to grow up around David and Saul is still king. Saul doesn't know, know that David's been anointed by Samuel. But it's Saul who is king. Yet this was, in Saul's eyes, David's victory. So we'll do that next week. We'll be in 1 Samuel chapter 18. So would you pray with me? Gracious Lord, as we leave here today, ah, just let us bask in this wonderful story. Um, let us remember that David got it right, regardless of all this and that and that and this. It's a story about your rescue, yet again, of your people, David's trust in you, his faith in you, putting his life on the line for you, confident that you would carry him through this, that you would carry the Israelites through this, and you would put an end to this embarrassment of your people. May we be strong and courageous and faithful as young David is, was. All this we pray in Jesus' name, amen.